Hello and welcome to the Amazing Studios production podcast. I'm Cliff Bumgardner. And I'm Peter Scheibner. Peter, we have a special guest today. We do have a special guest. We have uh, Brian the intern with us today. Uh, and and for those of you watching and listening, you won't realize this, but this is actually our second recording of this episode. <laughs> uh, we just finished recording, but the intern, I mean, that's who we're going to blame it on anyway, forgot to hit record on sound. Which is why he's only an intern. Yes, yeah. that's why he is the intern. The uh, uh, AD didn't remind but, uh, me. We've had Brian with us for the last 10 weeks. Uh, really? It's been 10 weeks? It has. It, wow. June 1st is when yeah. it started. Wow. Uh, and tomorrow, I think, is your last day, isn't it? Tomorrow is my last day. Brian, how's the internship been? It has been a roller coaster of fun, almost like high school again, just with all guys in a small studio room. So basically just like my high school then. That was my high school experience. <laughs> all dudes sitting behind a computer. It sounds very familiar to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we, we're going to be talking about uh, your intern experience in more depth in a little bit, and kind of what you've been learning, what you've been learning, what what some takeaways might be for you. But before we do that, every week we like to talk about what we've been watching. So it's only fitting, I think, that uh, Brian, you kick us off this week as our guest. Yeah. So the most recent film I've gotten to enjoy has been The Social Network. Ooh. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed seeing um, just the way that that uh, uh, social media has. Or no, I'm sorry that the 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 social network has kind of expressed what adding a girl on Facebook is really like because <laughs> the end of the movie is really it's what every guy goes through <laughs> yeah just waiting and waiting accurate. refreshing that page well and I think you know for me as a filmmaker that was kind of like a, a dream film come true the only thing that could have made that better was if Deacon shot it because you have <laughs> uh, a Fincher mm-hmm. film written by Aaron Sorkin yep I mean. Does it get any better than that? No. And here's one of my favorite facts about the social network. And Brian, I don't know if I've told you this. There is no director's cut or deleted scenes from that film. It is 100% the script. If you read the script, which I'm a nerd, I have. (laughs) If you read the script, it and the movie are one-to-one. Nothing was cut out because when you're Aaron Sorkin, you roll deep. That's So this is an interesting thing for me is that watching movies with Brian as, as I have this summer... Brian is a is a, he's a wonderful photographer and a DP, and he does not care about the script. <laughs> he doesn't care. You can watch a movie with him, and he's just like, "Oh man, that shot, that one shot with the sun and the the yeah. the, the thing." And I go, "Oh yeah, yeah." And what about that one line of dialogue? And he's like, "That that happened. I don't I don't remember." So from a visual perspective, what what do you think of the social network? What were your takeaways? Oh, I absolutely love that. We were talking earlier in the car on the way back from a shoot, and uh, Peter was mentioning how how locked down it feels and not in the fact that it's on a tripod, but in the fact that it feels like there's no physical operator. Right. And I think that's a style that a lot of people go for. Um, it's just a lot of people don't have the budget for it because a heavy, strong jib is, it's kind of expensive. Yeah. Um, and all the people to operate that and thing. the people. Right. Um, but it's a really great style to be able to push through an environment and not feel like there is a, an, an operator. Yeah. I think it's really, um, I would say trippy, but I can't think of a different word for it. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, and it, it, I think The Social Network was a movie to me that was so genius that it was shot digitally and it was shot with that style. I mean, that's Fincher's style, but it, it was shot in that style because it's a movie about the digital world mm-hmm. and it feels digital. It was one of the smartest uses of digital cinema technology I think I've ever seen because it feels like what it's about. It feels a little bit too perfect. It feels a little bit synthetic, which is the experience of a social network. So I always thought that was genius. And remind me, that was shot on the Mysterium X, wasn't it? No, that was Red One. That was was that oh, the Red Social one? Network was Red One. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, this was early. I think I th- want to say that was Fincher's first Red film, not his first digital, but it was his first Sounds on Red. Because right. I Timeline. think, and Peter, you have a better encyclopedic brain about this than I do. I believe it was the first film to win Best Picture that was shot on red. It mm. did not win Best Picture. It did not? What did it win? It lost Best Picture to King's Speech. Oh, right. That was that yeah. year. It was did that, it, that was the big year. Did it win cinematography? Um, I don't. I know, I know it won something that people were really I, excited because it was the first red film mm. that won in some it, category. It I can't remember what it won, was. It might have won at the BAFTAs. Oh, yeah. That could be the case. Yeah. But I mean, American, so I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, Peter, what, what about you? What have you been uh, seeing lately? Well, I'm uh, I'm working on clearing my list of films from a long period of time that I haven't seen. And one that's been on my list now for oh, several years that from the time it was in theaters, I knew I needed to see it. And I just never got around to it was No Country for Old Men. Oh. Um, mm. Wow. I mean, Javier Bordemo, what an incredible performance. I'd seen him already in Skyfall. 
And I think I wish I'd seen No Country before I saw Skyfall. Yeah. Because I had this yeah. great respect for Javier Bourdain in, in Skyfall alone, but I would have appreciated him even more uh, after his performance in No Country. It's an incredible film. I mean, it, it's a Coen Brothers film, but honestly, of all the Coen Brothers films, it feels the least like a Coen Brothers film. Um, I mean, it's got those. It has it has the whites. It has the things you expect to see in a Coen mm-hmm. Brothers film, but the dialogue is so sparse. Mm-hmm. The um, the story really is of all of their films one of the most simplistic. Oh yeah, um, it's cat and mouse. That's the is. whole story. It is, um, and there's there's very little plot to it. Mm-hmm. But the plot that they have is so solid they didn't need anything else. And it was also I was commenting to, to Brian, there's no subplots. Mm-mm. There's no, you know, this little story over here, this no, there's there's one plot. I mean you could you could say that kind of the emotional subplot of the film is Tommy Lee Jones and mm-hmm. his journey into understanding the changing landscape. Yeah. I would say that's kind of a subplot in that film. Yeah, and that's kind of overall the theme. Yeah. But it, what was incredible is it really hit its theme. Mm-hmm. into the movie, but you couldn't really see it until you got to the end. Um, right. Overall, I mean, uh, there's a lot of elements in the film that are just very different. I mean, the fact that there's only 14 minutes of score in a two and a half hour film. And a lot of it's contextual score, not mm-hmm. even, yeah. um, you know, it's, 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 it, it breaks a lot of the rules yeah. of filmmaking, um, but it does it better than anybody else. I think I've seen ever do it. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, I think, uh, doing a little bit of research, um, neither it nor, um, there will be blood did remarkably well. And, and yeah. I think part of that might have to do with the fact that they both came out in the same year, mm-hmm. had the same look, mm-hmm. same feel from the trailers. Yeah. Uh, and I think Shot people, similar to what you saw a couple years ago with Olympus has fallen and white house down. Please, please don't compare those two movies. No, to, no, no, <laughs> to no, no, no. But, but similar, similar issue where it's, it's audiences get a little bit of confusion. Yeah, and they don't know which one's which. Well, I mean, or, you know, or why they should care. There will be blood, and No Country literally shot across the street from each other. Yeah, there was one point where uh, No Country was shut down because smoke from the Derek there explosion, will be blood, yeah, uh, was ruining their shoot. Yeah. I remember talking about that. I think we talked about that on a previous episode. Yeah, I think we did too. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so No Country for Old Men, uh, great watch. Um, I will definitely be watching that again here with a pen and paper because there's a lot to learn. Yeah, I need. To, it's been a long time for me. I need to go back and watch it again Mm -hmm. um my film uh that i'm going to be talking about is a little bit newer it is mission impossible rogue (laughs) nation uh you guys have not uh, if you listen to the podcast you've not had the pleasure yet of meeting jeremiah he is our animator here at the studio and he's an awesome guy uh get him on it yes he has a major tom cruise crush and uh he He calls him tc yes Mm. and we all know what he's talking about when he says that too um and Jeremiah, a couple of weeks ago, started saying, oh, man, I can't wait for Rogue Nation. I can't wait for Rogue Nation. And I was like, eh, I had seen the other Mission Impossibles. I like them. They're fine. But it wasn't like I don't rush to the theater when one comes out. And Jeremiah was so passionate about it that by the time it came out, I had to go see it. And uh, actually, this past Tuesday, we uh, we here at the studio celebrated 20 years um, of, of being in business. We had a big party. And afterwards, we all went out or a large chunk of us went out to see Rogue Nation. Um, fun movie. I mean, it's, uh, it's a very, this one in particular is very genre. It is very much a spy movie Mm -hmm. and that is kind of all it's trying to be. Kind of a return to form. Um, I don't know if I would necessarily call it a return to form so much in that as much to, to me, the thing about Rogue Nation that was both a benefit and a, and a detriment was that it plays within its box entirely. It doesn't really branch out. It doesn't really try anything new. It doesn't It doesn't take any great leaps. It just plays as what it is, and it plays very well, um, I think. Um, you know, obviously Tom Cruise is great. The cast was re- the cast was really solid in this. Jeremy Renner. Oh, I mean, yeah. To have, well, if you have Jeremy Renner or Simon Pegg or Tom Cruise in a movie, that's enough to get me to see that movie. To have all three in one is incredible. And Simon Pegg was fantastic. I thought he was hilarious. Mm-hmm. Um and in a second, I want to talk about the visuals because Brian was with us and he saw it as well. And I'm interested to see what he thought. But one of the biggest things that I want to talk about from a story perspective, and this is something that I really see plaguing a lot of action movies today, and it's, it's nothing new, but I see it a lot right now, is the idea of the bulletproof hero, the hero who cannot die. And and this isn't a spoiler, but you know, if you've seen the trailers, if you've, you've heard about this film, you, you probably know the, the, the big airplane scene where... 
Tom Cruise is hanging on to the side of, an, of a huge military aircraft as it's taking off. That's the opening scene of the movie. That is that just is. I mean, boom. It goes straight into was that. Was it as awesome as it looked? It was, but I would say it felt... My, my two problems with it is, one, it felt like it was there just to be a stunt. It really had no bearing on the plot whatsoever. It was honestly like the movie starts and we're in this sequence and this happens. And it kind of starts the breadcrumbs that open the movie, but not really. And it's just kind of a throwaway scene. It's just kind of like a cold open. Yeah, it very much is. It's before the, it's before the opening uh, credits and, and all that. And it's just kind of in there. But the uh, the biggest thing about it to me is when you open a film with your lead character jumping onto a moving plane, hanging onto the plane, then getting sucked into the plane, banging around, almost flying out the back, and then parachuting out of the back of this massive aircraft. I cannot care about that character when later, and again, this isn't this should not be a spoiler for anyone, you want me to believe that something bad is going to happen to him. Because, I mean, every Mission Impossible movie, they always have a, a moment where it's like, oh, is he going to die? What's going to happen? I can't care at that point. And it's not even so much a conscious thing of, sure, I know intrinsically Tom Cruise isn't going to die. He's the main character. It's not going to happen. But just subconsciously, you know, it's a big difference from, from say, Rogue Nation to Skyfall, which we know James Bond isn't going to die. But he starts off that film getting shot and falling, being believed dead, and he has to come back, and he's not at his best, and he's not really prepared for the mission, and we have doubt. And just on a subconscious level, I think that allows us as an audience to to connect with him more. Mm-hmm. Um and 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 kind of you know really feel for him and, and feel his character in, in the story, that's completely lost with with something like Rogue Nation, yeah, which I is probably my biggest problem with it. As fun and action oriented and everything as it was, it was you know again it was a blast. But I just that was something that through the whole movie I just couldn't get off uh, get out of my head. I think that's one of the major differences between the new James Bond films and the Mission Impossible films is that Ethan Hawke is a bulletproof character. Um, Ethan Hunt. Sorry, Ethan Hunt uh, is a is a bulletproof character. Whereas James Bond, at least as Daniel Craig has been portraying him, yeah, I mean he he is very vulnerable. Yeah, and Jason Bourne as well, very Jason vulnerable, Bourne, very very vulnerable, mm. vulnerable. And uh, I, I think um, you know the old James Bonds were never that way, especially the Pierce Bronson. I mean, yeah, that man couldn't. He couldn't die. No, you couldn't. You couldn't cut him. I mean, he he right. didn't bleed. Um, and I think that's an interesting turn on the super action hero right. um, genre where now we're starting to see some of these heroes who, who can die and, yeah. and can get hurt. Yeah, and I, 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 um, I want to see more of that. All right. But so, from, real quickly, sh- just from a visual side, Brian, I am interested to hear your... Yeah. We're, 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 we kind of need to move on on time, but just what your thoughts were. Well, on, really on quick, location. like you were saying, um, it's very much the spy genre as far as the story and as far as what they're trying to show you. They're trying to show you that this guy is the man. He's the spy. Yeah. Um, so I think you see a lot of like the nighttime scenes where, um, you know, if there's a road there, let's wet it. Let's make it really contrasty. Let's make him walk out in silhouettes. Yeah. And, you know, let's make him look really awesome, um, which I think is, is a really I like that in the fact that since it is a very spyish movie um, that they kind of stayed to that that visual style. Yeah. Um, what do you think of the screen direction? <laughs> we were talking about this earlier. Um, you know, recently in some films, we've been noticing a lot of really bad screen direction. Um, you know, we just get confused. And, you know, I've seen it used a lot where they want the audience to be confused as to where they are. Mm-hmm. But when it's not used that way, it's really annoying. Well, you compare something like Rogue Nation to what I talked about last week with Mad Max. In Mad Max, the screen direction is all over the place in a lot of it, but you still know where you are. I felt like in some just you know, three, four person dialogue scenes in Rogue Nation, I had no clue where they were in relation to each other. I had no clue if they were behind in front, if they're at the window, whatever. And it was, it was very jarring at yeah. times, uh, especially in a movie that needs as much exposition as that to confuse you in the middle of a dialogue scene. I thought was kind of a, an odd, uh, or an unfortunate side effect. Yeah. So, um, let's move ahead and let's talk to you, Brian. We're going to interview you about your experience so far this summer, and I'm going to let Peter start because he hired you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I, I, met, I met Brian uh, back in March when we were interviewing uh, for the positions, and uh, we were technically only opening this up to juniors in college. However, I received a recommendation from a school that we were looking at uh, that they had this incredible sophomore 
uh, with with uh, above average talent, and that we should reach out and and interview him. Why do we get Brian instead of that guy? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, I have so a good agent. Okay, <laughs> we, um, I interviewed Brian. He was the exception to the rule, and uh, true to form, he he delivered on the interview, and so I had high expectations when he came. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> so so that was I. I I had a lot of faith having seen some of the work that you've done. Um, and we'll put links below uh, oh to boy. your YouTube channel so folks can see some of the work that you've done. And should his Flickr as well. Um, he's an amazing photographer. Oh, yeah. An incredible photographer. Thank I you. think probably photographer first and foremost. Um, That's where it started. So so I, I can say from my end, you lived up to expectations. You, you lived up to the hype that surrounded you uh, this summer. But what I want to know is, did this internship and what, did, what you saw here, did it meet your expectations? And is this... Is this what you were expecting oh. when you walked into Amazing Studios? And what were your expectations? Okay, so let's start off with the expectations from the interview. Um, all the jobs that I've had, I've, I've worked maintenance. I've worked at a daycare. I've worked um, as a, a university photographer. Um, and I've never had a proper interview. So honestly, when I went into this, I wanted to see how I would do in a real interview because I knew it was only open to juniors and seniors at first. Um, so my, my first thoughts were, I'm just going to see, uh, how I do with talking to someone I've never met and trying to impress them. Um, so that was fun. And then going into this internship, you know, um, being in the narrative form, we don't originally think of, I'm going to go do documentaries. Um, and that's, that's a bulk of what we do here. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I've really fallen in love with it. Um, it's a different style of what I thought as far as the process of filmmaking. Um, it's a very upbeat, really fast paced style to do things. Um, but there's a lot of story in it yeah. and that's the best part. Um, so expectations were, I'm going to go to a studio and I'm going to learn kind of a B roll. <laughs> I'm going to learn a little bit of a, a B plan um, for my career and See, just being able to have up with all summer folks, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of a, a, a B plan of what I'm going to do in life. Um, like I can, I could just go do this on the side sometimes, but really it's turned into something that, you know, this is something I can really learn from. And that's something that's really, um, influenced me. Um, you know, a lot of great people have gotten their start in documentaries. Um, Deacon started out doing documentaries for years Finch. and you know, it mm -hmm. has he really. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's proven it obviously with those, with their, um, their whole repertoire of what they've done. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like if you start in documentary, you can do just about anything because mm -hmm. documentary is half the time, not a lot of planning, <laughs> not a lot of setup. When you can you, form a story out of nothing, right, you're good. You run in there and you get what you can get and you have to figure out the story as you, as you go. And I think that's a really great skill to have. Yeah. yeah. I think the best, the best editors by far come from documentary. Mm -hmm. And the, I think, I think some of the strongest directors come from, documentary because they understand at its core what story is and how to pick it out as you're hearing it yeah how to pick it out as you're seeing it because when you get back in post you're gonna have if you've done your job well mountains of footage mm -hmm. to cull through and without a script or anything there's no organization to it you have to decide and so on set you need to be deciding okay i'm seeing these things happening Here's in my mind how the story builds out so you can go back and find them again in post. I, I compare it to comedy mm -hmm. in that I would say narrative film, narrative like scripted film is stand up where you have a script, you know what you're going to do and you go out and you fine tune it based on how things go, but you know where you're going. Mm -hmm. Documentary is improv. Mm -hmm. Documentary is you go out, you don't know what's going to happen and anytime something happens, you just have to adapt to it and keep going yep. and you have to find that thread every minute. Okay. Well, Cliff, what's your question for? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm interested. <laughs> What'd you say? I said, bring it. <laughs> um, I, I'm interested. In something you were talking about earlier today about that. I mean, it was it was great for me to hear that this was a takeaway that you had, but that you you had really learned the importance of a good team and a good oh, work man. environment. Um, so I'm wondering, kind of, what your thoughts on on that were coming into to to the studio yeah. this summer, and kind of how <laughs> that changed and evolved. And what your thoughts are now that you're, you know, headed yeah. back to school. So like be still being in school, um, I've really come from the area of this one student has to do everything himself. Um, and that's a huge load to carry. Um, but then you get put in an environment where you have, you know, eight people who are extremely talented in their own areas and they're still talented in your own, in your own areas as well. 
Yeah. So you're really able to bounce off ideas. You're able to, you know, distribute some of the workload. Um, and, and what I was going to say with, along with that earlier was, you know, the work environment is incredibly necessary. Um, what we have here is, you know, being able to kind of not really mess around, but just talk about film and that is learning for us. And that is actually putting time into our projects. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that work environment is extremely important. Yeah, that's great. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we've been able to cultivate that. that <laughs> Absolutely. Is, I mean, that's, that's what it's all about is, is it, I think, and this is, I mean, an important thing for anyone listening to this who's in the creative field. I think you have to keep in mind that when you're doing creative work, it's not enough just to be creative in the work. You have to be creative and foster creative environment for everyone. Um, whether, whether that's the, the intern making coffee, which I think you did twice. This time? I did twice because I've been failing at it. Jeremiah is really good at it, and I still <laughs> haven't tried. Obviously, is the god of coffee. You know, yeah. Dustin left yesterday, and I haven't tried his coffee yet. Yeah, I, I, I think I've had one sip. It's actually really not that good. <laughs> <laughs> he them, doesn't listen to this podcast, so we can say that. Them's fighting words, Peter. Perfect. Actually, he masters. Well, he he masters this podcast, but he probably doesn't listen. No, <laughs> he, doesn't. <laughs> he, do, he doesn't care. He's the art department. Yeah, they they do bad doodles. Which, by the way, baddoodles dot com. Check it out. Yes, absolutely. There's a great commercial for that. That's coming out <laughs> soon, right? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, the commercial that for that will be dropping very soon. Uh, we, Before we, this is seen, actually. Yeah, we we mentioned uh, a week or two ago that we were we had some special projects. That uh, we're going to be, we were going to be showing at our 20th anniversary party. We can now reveal that one of them was a parody of The Office called The Studio, and for that we made some commercials. One of which is for the production podcast, which was actually completely no a completely normal commercial. Right. We, at the at the time, our understanding was that what they wanted was. A commercial. A real commercial. Like, you know, yeah. this is what it is. And then we did not know about Professor BM Doodles oh at the time. Goodness. Which will make sense if you've seen that commercial. Who's actually standing behind the cameras right now. Yeah. yeah it's because Brandon is usually behind the camera. I mean, Brian is I normally behind the camera. <laughs> Brandon is now behind. It's now the uh, uh, taking that role. Which is that there were 46 takes of that one shot? Yes. <laughs> if, if you've seen Bad Doodles, the, that commercial, there were 46 clips in my in, in in my bin to edit <laughs> it into that commercial. That's how long it took to get those thirty seconds out. Yep. Um, but one one another interesting thing I think we should talk about is just honestly for you and me, Peter. Um, I don't know about you. I've never worked with an intern before. No, this is the first for me too. Me yeah, either. absolutely. And kind of what maybe our expectations were and what we've learned from working with Brian. Because I, I think the the thing about Brian and I'm not gonna I'm gonna try not to talk about you like you're not here. Um, the thing just that I've really Admi admire about you and, and that I've I've really come to see this summer is that you're not a Swiss army knife. Peter and I come from that role, from, from the world of, of having to do everything and you have to be able to do everything well but you tend to not end up doing everything perfectly. Mm -hmm. Kind mm -hmm. of jack of all trades. You're not a Swiss army knife. You do a couple of things but you do them brilliantly. You are a really good hammer Instead of a Swiss Army knife, you are a precision tool. Like I said, you don't care about the script or the story <laughs> or that whole process. You don't care about directing. You don't care about necessarily editing, even though you have done some great editing for us this summer. But what you are good at, I would say you have more knowledge in than Peter or I. In visual sense. Yes. You you can take a camera into the most boring place and, and make something out of it that that would, I mean, would, that would take me... And I'm Hours. a DP. Yeah, I mean, I'm a DP <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and and so I've it, it's been interesting to to work with you in that capacity and and kind of and learn from that. And I'm I'm curious what Peter's take takeaway well, is. Let me, on that let me as butt well. in here. Thank yeah, you so, for those um, wonderful. So when we designed this internship. Uh, you know, I sat down with with my boss Mike, and I, I said, you know, Mike, I wanna I, I want to be a teaching studio. I think I think that's gonna be a good for a couple reasons. One, I do believe that by investing in those coming up behind us is important. But two, it also helps to keep us sharp. And so one of the things, one of the takeaways from this. Um, this summer was just how much of an education it was for you and I to mm -hmm. be on our game to answer Brian's questions. Yeah, um, for sure. But, but we wanted to make this. Uh, I also wanted to make this as uh, an appealing internship. A lot of times, um, and I'm actually going to call out our field a little bit on this one because we are really bad at this. Mm -hmm. um, we They're don't atrocious. make internships worth people's while. Mm -mm. Uh, first off, this was a paid internship. I think if you're if you're listening to this podcast and you are able to offer an internship, offer a paid internship. It wasn't a lot. I mean, it's not like this cost us a fortune to 
you know, to bring Brian on, but it was enough to, to feed him. It was a, it was a fortune. Um, you know, we provided room and board. Uh, he, he boarded with my wife and I, um, and uh, we've got a nice guest room that he was in for the summer. Uh, and, Next summer you're with me. And then uh, <laughs> on the completion of this, so when you complete this tomorrow, uh, there's a, a sizable scholarship uh, for your next semester of school. And that is a real internship. Yeah. That's an opportunity for somebody where they can, without having to worry about how am I going to pay for school next year, yeah. really focus on learning. So that's the first step. Um, and that was the first thing I think that made this summer successful. But for me, what made this such a, a great um, learning experience for me, but also a great opportunity was that, uh, that idea of having somebody around who, who always asks questions. And Brian, you had a lot of excellent questions this summer. Why do you do this? And you, you even said, you know, you walked in not with a big background in, in documentary, which, which obviously for Cliff and I was a heavier um, focus of, of our education and of our, of our developing as filmmakers yeah. was documentary. So you walked in with a lot of questions that were good because it made me then go back and question, okay, why am I doing this? Uh, what is my, my process? And, and how then do I explain that? And, and going through that and having to go through that process of explaining it to somebody, why I do what I do, was really good for me too. Teaching is uh, the best way to learn. It is. Mm-hmm. It is. Uh, so that was highly valuable. Obviously the help. I mean, like like Cliff said, you're a hammer. And when I say that, it doesn't mean that you're you – know, obviously if anybody – if you're watching <laughs> this on YouTube, you can see that uh, Brian could eat. Cliff and I. Yeah, he could he could kill us with one hand. Carl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I, um, but not just that. Not just that. You know, you were a big help. You were a grip. But that you could actually, you know, contribute. Your, your gaffing skills were very appreciated this summer. Your your, yeah. um, you know, decisions on angles. And even today, we were out on a shoot this morning, and uh, I was going through the footage that you'd shot with the Ronin uh, and the Red. And, and just some incredible art in deciding, okay, as I'm going, here's where eye lines are. The eye lines are looking this way. I'm going to go ahead and justify her here. And mm-hmm. as she kind of shifts her, her focus, I'm going to bring the frame this way, which really, it, it shows a level of artistry that I don't know if you can teach that. No. And, and as a director, I, I was actually uh, directing on the shoot this morning. As a director, it's wonderful to be able to say, look, here's the shot I want. Here's the sequence. Here's going to be these three. This is what I'm looking for. Go. Mm-hmm. And you don't, I don't have to step into the role of also being a DP because I know that you're going to execute. Yeah. And, and one thing I was, I was going to mention that you touched on there, there's an idea, um, that, I mean, I first heard it from a, from kind of a corporate speaker, but I, I'm sure it originated elsewhere. There's an idea of reverse mentoring, mm-hmm. which is that you find someone younger than you, um, who maybe doesn't have as much experience in the way that you do necessarily, but who can kind of keep you on your toes and keep you informed. And I would encourage anyone, especially in the creative field, invest in young talent, invest in bringing people on who are younger than you or who, you know, are, are, are still kind of making their way and, and trying to figure out, figure things out because you will never, ever regret giving young talented people a shot Mm -hmm. brian has elevated all of us this summer um and i don't think that i don't think honestly that brian's a one in the million or one in a million brian is is an amazing intern an amazing guy um and i think there are more people out out there like that and i think that if you give people several of yeah absolutely strong candidates for this internship and and i think if you give people a shot who are passionate and who who you know, want an opportunity to actually do something, to not sit in an office making copies and coffee all summer, but actually be out there and be doing it. If you give people that chance, they will surprise and impress you. Um, and so uh, that's that. I think that's kind of the, one of the biggest takeaways for this whole podcast is for people to go out and give give people a shot. It, it, it will always be worth it. All right. So as we start to to wrap this up, I think I know a good way that we can do it is to tell a little bit of a story about how Brian's summer began because we threw Brian into the oh, fire man. on day one. You and I actually met while <laughs> packing up all the gear to get on the road, head to Greensboro, and uh, and shoot for three days at a conference. Are you thinking the bus story? I'm thinking the bus story. <laughs> oh. I'm, also, I'm also thinking of day one, minute one, we shove Brian into a hotel room with the two of us where we then spend three days all locked in a room, shooting around the clock, editing around the clock. It was the greatest introduction. Absolutely. I think had. If, if you weren't going to work out, we would have known it day one. Oh, yeah. And we would have sent you back quickly. Yes. <laughs> but what, what ended up happening, and this was just, I mean, you know, this is just what happens in the hectic nature of a shoot. Um, for this conference, they were taking 
the company was taking their 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 salespeople uh, up to their corporate headquarters, Bassett, Virginia. Yes, in Bassett, Virginia, is really nowhere. Yes, yep. <laughs> that basically all that's there is Bassett Furniture. That's yeah. that's all that's in the entire. And a general. post office. I saw a post. Oh yeah, was there one? And uh, they they were. T- and it was in Virginia, by the way, Brian. Um, which we'll <laughs> that goes along with that story, yeah. Yes. Uh, but they were taking all their salespeople up to to Bassett for the day to to see the the factory, to take tours and see the showroom and all that kind of stuff. And they had four, I think, big like trailways buses that they were loading everybody on. Well, Peter and I made the mistake of thinking that all of the buses were headed to the same place. So we say, okay, well, we'll be in the car going behind the buses with another camera so we can get road footage. Brian, you get on one of the buses and film the people on the way. We didn't know which bus Brian got on. Yes, we just knew that he got on a bus, and we said, oh, it's no big deal. We're all going to the same place. We'll follow him. Peter and I get in the car. We're getting ready to leave. Peter starts looking at all the paperwork, and suddenly it hits him that all four buses are going to four separate places. Now... Keep in mind, Brian, this is his second day with us, I believe. He has one camera, one card, and one battery because we d- we thought we'd be seeing him in a few minutes and we didn't think it would be a big deal. And we're now throwing him on a bus to go up to a completely different state. He is by himself, uh, essentially. Uh, no one else from the studio with him with not enough media, not enough battery life. And Peter and I had a minor freak out. <laughs> we were like, wow, we've already killed the intern. Yeah, we we, we blew it on day one. But uh, again, as a testament to Brian, he overcame and adapted. And battery amazing. Conservation yeah, it taught me a lot about yeah. uh, preserving the economy and yeah, the environment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the economy of memory cards, the environment of... You know, me existing. Right. That's the ecology of film, of batteries and <laughs> batteries and memory cards. We have we to conserve. find him about four hours later. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I was like, tied up behind a trash Because <laughs> <laughs> we ended up all circling each other the rest of the day. But then the, the fitting into the story is that after it's all over, we're on the way back to the hotel that night. And we're all laughing. Oh, man, I can't believe Brian got on the bus, got shipped off to Virginia. And Brian goes, I was in Virginia? Who knew? He had, Besides, not me. <laughs> he obviously had no clue where he was, which would, makes it even worse on us because we're technically <laughs> responsible for him. Yeah, uh, I hope his mother doesn't listen to this podcast. And yeah. if, if you do, uh, Mrs. French, that was really a long time ago. We've yeah. grown up a lot since then. Yes, we have matured. She did the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, uh, so Brian was, okay. was 19. Yeah, I was back when he was, so, oh, he's twenty now. Yeah, yeah. He's a, we're, everything is. All I can eat different. my dessert before my meal now. <laughs> Cliff, why don't you go ahead and, uh, and get us started? I, sh- I shall, Brian. But honestly, uh, it's been great working through the summer. It's yeah, been great to get to know pleasure. you. It's been awesome working with you guys. We've as well. made a lot of jokes that you are Brian the intern, but I think now here at the end we can just call you Brian and call <laughs> you a friend. Brian the friend. Brian the friend, and it is it has been a pleasure. And it's also been a pleasure to talk to all of you who are listening or watching. Uh, remember, if you're watching on YouTube, you can listen to this for your commute, downloads for, for your commute, uh, or for your your you know your daily run or whatever on iTunes. And if you're listening on iTunes, you can go to our YouTube channel AMZG TV and uh, watch the video version of this and see Brian's beautiful face. So uh, Brian, <laughs> why don't we go ahead before we hit head into our wrap up and let you say goodbye. All right, this is Brian signing off. French out. French out. All right, folks, and don't forget to craft stories worth telling.